Uh, welcome you all uh, on behalf of SLAUS. Uh, this is uh, Euromed uh, 3.3. Uh, today we are going to discuss about the topics on the prostate cancer prevention and screening as well as uh, diagnostic evaluation of the prostate cancer as well as uh, localized prostate cancer management and with the article discussion. So as a moderator, I'm proud to be here. Uh, and I will introduce the expert panel. First, uh, uh, Dr. Professor, Professor Srinath Sandrasekhar, sir, and uh, Dr. Aravindan, and Dr. Surang. Professor Srinath is unable to Professor Srinath is uh, uh, unable yes, to attend. Suren sir is here. Yeah, I'm I'm there. Suren yeah, is okay, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Then as expert panel, uh, we then replacing the Suren sir on behalf of the uh, Dr. Srinath Chandra Sekhar, sir. And, uh, and I will, uh, without wasting time, I would like to introduce the uh, best presenter, uh, Mr. Prasanna, uh, over to you. Prasanna, you can start your presentation. Uh, meanwhile, uh, this time we have uh, uh, so started in a different way, <clears throat> asking a questions. And uh, while you are going through the slides, actually we can start with the question uh, when you share the presentation. So... You can share the presentation now and over to you, Prasanna. You can start now. The moderators as well as expert panel will continue uh, and ask questions uh, while you going through the presentation. Good evening, students and the others uh, who have connected with the Zoom platform. I am Taha here. So what we thought was, uh, I mean, uh, last time we had this discussion, yeah. That you know, going through the presentation, there is a repetition of uh, facts, yeah. and that you know, boring the facts. Being we have been listening to the facts, so we thought of you know starting with questions and case scenarios mm -hmm. while they are presenting the I mean the presentation. Is that okay, sir? Okay. We can ask two questions. Okay. Then yeah, that so, uh, we yeah. can do their presentation. So first, it's in person. My, my I'm problem is, here. Uh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I am going to. Yes, sir. Can, yeah. Yes. Uh, yeah. Can timing. you see my? Yeah, we can see your presentation. I think that probably uh, your your topics is in the low, uh, left corner side. Is it is it right or? Yes. It is yes, not. Sir. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Fine. You go ahead. Yeah, um, good evening, so, everyone. Sorry, I mean, sorry to trouble you. So, what we thought was rather than yes. going through the presentation, just we'll do a case and then you can carry on from there. Is that okay with you? Because it's going to be a, like a, a small bit of viva. Yes. And you, you know, we'll discuss. So, the case is a 47 year old man. Yes. With history of low and tract symptoms, voiding predominantly, referred by a doctor, family doctor with a PSA of 5.1. He has come with the son and he is in front of you. How are you going to assess this patient? Yeah, so this patient with the 45 years with the PSA 5.5. So I will. Initially, get the detailed history regarding the large symptoms and the mainly the <clears throat> cause both voiding and the storage symptoms and any features of uh, hematuria and any features of metastasis. And other than that, I will ask the risk factors for the prostate cancer. Then I will provide with the targeted examination to identify the any features of or suspicious features for the prostate malignancy. Then, after that, I will discuss with the both uh, son and uh, father regarding the risk of go ahead with the uh, 
trust bias because uh, this patient with the young patient with uh, psa of 5.5 is a significant one so i will discuss with that but make i will make sure uh, there's no any features of infection like prostatitis and uh, there's no any uh, recent instrumentation or any uh, surgical procedures then i will uh, discuss and go ahead with the trust biopsy uh, to diagnose the prostate ce so can... doctor yeah we can inter- we can uh, time to we can ask some questions also no rather than talking yes. so will you do the will you do the yes. mri or not that is a question no yes so when i discuss i will uh, discuss with the pros and cons of the psa and using the other parameters of psa and discuss the uh, mri uh, using the mri and mri guided biopsy or targeted biopsy so i will use the all the available options so rather than directly go ahead with the trust biopsy i will available options like perineal biopsy or other template biopsy then i will uh, take the decision regarding the go ahead with the uh, diagnosing the prostate cancer okay prasanna uh, will you ask anything about the family history of prostate yes. cancer in this patient what is the significance Yes, sir. So, as this patient is very young, uh, less than forty-five years of age, so family history is very important. Mainly, the I will ask the first-degree relatives and the number of patients and number of patients who has developed the prostate cancer with below the fifty years of age, and any affected members with hereditary conditions like BRCA one and two mutations or Lynch syndrome. So, those things I will ask from the uh, hereditary part. other than that other risk factors also i will go ahead but uh, those are very limited value like uh, uh, smoking history and uh, uh, any std infection so those those things also i will ask in the history part so the son is there he is asking his grandfather had a prostate cancer what is the risk of having a prostate cancer in this index patient But so what I'm asking is, what do you call? What do you mean by hereditary prostate cancer? Uh, hereditary prostate cancer means, sir, if it is family members of first degree relatives, uh, three or more than three members, three consecutive generations are affected, and uh, two or more. That one, I, I'm not sure, sir. Uh, two or more. Uh, that one I am not sure. Uh, there are three conditions. So either it is three first degree relative or three relatives under the age of fifty five years, and it should be three generations, no? Yes. Yes, three generations. Yeah. So what is the risk of so, having a prostate cancer if one family member has a prostate cancer? One family. I am not uh, sure. So, if one relative is affected, two to three. If two to two relatives are affected, five to six, and more than I mean, if three relatives are affected, it is around eleven eleven times. Eleven, eleven, eleven times. Again, the patient's son is asking whether this PSA is compatible with his age. Yes, sir. Uh, age study you are going to court and. How are you going to explain to his son whether this PSA is normal for his age? Doctor Suranka, Sri uh, Suren sir, uh, yeah, shall we continue a... like that, sir? I mean, uh, mm-hmm. shall we go with the presentation? Yeah, uh, I, I think you need to bring up a few things like this, and then we can go. Uh, yeah. Because you're right. Um, I mean, you need to know the age. How big is this prostate? The significance of all that needs to be addressed before uh, 
doing anything with this uh, elevated PSA, isn't it? Uh, is the patient having diabetes? Is there urine infection? You, do you act on one PSA on a 47-year-old man whose PSA is 5.1? So I think it's important that you have that discussion that you, you really need to know the density of this, uh, uh, all of that. And then, okay, you have no other explanation for this elevated PSA. You think it's abnormal, and then you proceed to see whether he's got cancer. I think that's important that you, you discuss that, and then we can, uh, you know, that's important that because that's how the clinical problem comes, isn't it? Every elevated PSA, you don't jump in and, and, and go ahead and uh, think of cancer and go down that road. So I think it's important, Taha, that you, you do what you're doing, and then we'll get, get to the, uh, because it's, the not entirely, uh, what shall I call it, academic. It's also training for the exams and all of that. So it's important, I think. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. so if you get a case yeah. like this, and now it's easy, very young. No, it's a 47 with a um, uh, slightly elevated PSA. So what the Surinza said, it's a history examination, investigation, and the rectal examination mainly. No, all this important. Because we want to we want we want to make sure this PSA is elevated not because of other benign conditions like a BPH or um, some infection or something, okay. Uh, so the clinical history and the examination is very important. Some some points uh, sometimes we uh, repeat the <coughs> PSA also at some point if the history is not conclusive or if there is no supporting then we repeat also, right? So history, examination, investigation is very important. Yeah. Yeah, so I thought was that Oosterling's Oosterling study, Oosterling. the age-specific PSA you have to go through, and then the medical student, his son is medical student, he wanted to know that GP has done a digital examination the, prior, the day prior to this uh, I mean, uh, conversation. And he wanted to know whether this DRE has caused this uh, rise of PSA. Uh, actually, sir, DR can cause light elevation, but uh, it is not the uh, clinically significant elevation uh, to take the decision in the prostate cancer. It can elevate slightly, but uh, it doesn't cause the clinical significance. Yes, that's true. So how it's much like it, uh, it elevate in the DRE? Any idea? It's a 0 0.2, what I remember. <laughs> Daha may be knowing better than me. 2, 6, so, yeah, exactly. Two, six, yeah. 0 0.2 something, yeah. <laughs> two, six, yes. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay, right. Yeah, I think so, we all should have a PSA, uh, I think, uh, six weeks apart. So, you know? I don't know. Yes. Sam Surang is speaking. Yes, yes, Dr. Suranga, welcome. I, yeah, yeah, welcome. Yeah, uh, thank you. Yeah, and I think the you must have a six, two PSA uh, six weeks apart. Otherwise, uh, normally, uh, we don't go ahead with the, any other investigation unless you have a two report. So unless you, it is a uh, parietal examination reveal it is a malignant feeling prostate. Otherwise, you need to have a two report six weeks apart. That is a, a nice guideline. Yeah. But the DRE, if the DRE is abnormal. The DRE is, if it is a DRE yeah. abnormal, yes. But even yeah. though if it is a granulometrous prostate, you will get a like a the parietal examination feels like a cancer. So yeah, then normally... you can do uh, the LUTs treatment. You have to treat yeah. if you're having a LUTs or infection, you treat that and repeat it. If still it's yeah. high, then yeah. Okay. Yeah, in, in, in MRI scan, normally it's it's scoring as a pirates by in the for granular matter sports it So it can uh, so you need to have uh, be careful about the PSA. Yeah, uh, you have to to PSA, unless it is a highly suspicious on prior examination. Prasan, again, that son is asking, what is the percentage of having cancer for this PSA? He is a medical student, he was selected, so he wanted to know what's the chance of having a cancer for this PSA. Yeah, you can read about no. Yes. You can so you have to read two things. One is age-related PSA, other one is the cancer risk according to the PSA levels. Yeah. Okay. 
So that's the PCPT trial, prostate cancer prevention trial. According to the PSA value, there is a risk. So we'll go yeah. through that. Okay. Right. Uh, so what we discussed till then is, I mean, assessment of patient, family history, hereditary prostate cancer, age-specific PSA, and uh, risk of uh, having prostate cancer and PSAs. Okay, Prasanna, yeah. Uh, Daha, you have any values for PSA and uh, uh, the prostate cancer, the positive yeah, support? That's the PCPT trial. So what yeah. they have shown is if it is less than one, there is a 10% chance of having a cancer. If it is less than for 27, 26.9 or 27% having a cancer. And if it is more than 10, it's 53%. So that is why that normal range recent studies they have taken, not the four, I mean, 2.3 is the normal value, some studies. Yeah, it's age related, you said, no? No, it's a PSA. PSA, no, PSA. PSA, 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 PSA risk of yeah. uh, malignancy. malignancy so if the psa is more than 50 almost always no it's a positive prediction value PPR. yes 100 yeah. if it is 100%. more than 20 87 percent the patient is going to have the cancer 87 87 yeah. yeah. percent so roughly you can uh, remember that if it is more than 20 or more than 50 it's almost always it's going to be positive it's 100 percent yeah okay uh Taha, sir. Excuse me, sir. So, uh, regarding now, uh, he can start the presentation and we can move on. No, so otherwise the time limitation and the other factors. Uh, yeah, yeah. He, he's mainly on the screening and prevention. We can go ahead with the in other lectures. Uh, yeah. The other things are there. We can discuss. So we can start. No. Actually, right. today's urometh is probably a trial and error because from yeah. next week onwards we may. Change this as to a viva session. That is okay. what the Euromet organizers thought of. So this is probably a trial and error session today. Sorry about this inconvenience. Yeah, Prasanna, you can go ahead to the start the presentation and we can in between they will expert panel will ask the questions. So prostate cancer uh, as discussed is the second most cancer in the worldwide. Uh, First one is the skin malignancy and uh, third one in the Sri Lanka. And uh, there are post-mortem studies says uh, when the age is increasing, it's increasing in uh, incidence. So around in the, at the 80 years, it's around 70 to 80 percent. And lifetime risk is one in nine persons who develop the prostate cancer. Median age at diagnosis is 66 years. And 71 percentage of prostate cancer death occur more than 75 years. And the late diagnosis Late stage diagnosis is more common age, more than 80 years. When we compare etiology and risk factors, uh, mainly the family history and hereditary prostate CA is the main risk factor, but it's around hereditary, it's around less than 10 percent. And metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, and uh, with the metformin, if it is using metformin, it's the uh, uh, chance is less than cholesterol and statin usage. And dietary factors like alcohol, coffee, dairy products, fat, or things, and hormone reactive medications like uh, fiol, paradoxes, inhibitors, testosterone, and other factors like inflammatory bowel disease, balding, gonorrhea infection, and cigarette smoking. And uh, when we look at the screening, the uh, definition for screening is uh, identification of disease in the asymptomatic population by the application of the test or examination. So there are three types, mainly opportunistic screening, targeted screening, and population-based screening. Uh, so PDSA screening for prostate cancer is controversial and does not fulfill all the Wilson and Younger's criteria for screening program. So... Uh, PSA lacks the specificity uh, only 40% specificity and the sensitivity and again less sensitivity. So this is the Wilson Younger's criteria for screening program. I don't go through the, all the things. And uh, age at which to begin prostate cancer screening depends on risk factors such as age, race, family history, and hereditary conditions. 
males with no identical risk factors can which can benefit of prostate testing starting at age of 50 to 55 years and uh, black males like uh, african americans and males with the family history of certain hereditary condition like green syndrome so consider starting psa testing at age 40 to 45 years frequency of testing ranges from yearly to every 2 years so annual or every 2 years but uh, recommendation is around 2, two years depending on the psa value age at which to discontinue psa again unclear so united states uh, task force recommend to stopping at age of 70 years and nccn is recommending stopping at age at uh, 75 years so main thing is the life expectancy more than should be more than 10 years when uh, compare the plc or trial uh, prostate lung colon and ovary so around more than 75000 men are included and uh, enroll in alfi center trial in the usa and randomly assigned to intervention versus control group so no difference in prostate cancer mortality in organized systematic annual psa testing versus opportunistic psa testing so there's the no difference in the prostate cancer mortality other trial is the protect trial in 2017 one uh, prostate testing for cancer and treatment so obtain men from the prostate cancer study patients are randomized equally between the radiotherapy versus radical prostatectomy versus active surgery so primary outcome prostate cancer mortality at 10 years of follow up so again there is no different significant difference was found between treatment modalities and here spc study the european study multinational european study group so screening arm versus observation arm so psa screening reduced the cancer specific death rate by 20 percent but no difference in overall survival so again psa screening will reduce the death rate but it won't uh, there's no any difference in the overall survival so there are three types of screening so mainly the we are these trials are mainly based on the population based screening so population based screening for prostate cancer remain one of the most controversial topic in the urological literature the main finding from randomized control trials are screening is associated with an increased diagnosis of prostate ca and it uh, detection of more localized disease and less advanced prostate ca so there's no prostate cancer specific survival benefit no overall survival but uh, the trials they didn't uh, target this endpoint so when we look at the targeted screening who are the people more benefit in targeted screening means those with a family history or any known mutation those are integrated to prostate cancer so mainly screening in patients with a BRCA mutation so, sanna yes uh, you have 5 minutes more just uh, you can try to finish it out mm-hmm. and so on that right yes so impact study when we impact study mainly they look for BRCA1 and 2 mutations and the controla so the impact study the influence of BRCA1 mutations mainly unclear but BRCA2 mutation carriers were associated with the higher incidence of prostate cancer and they diagnose more young age group and they are clinically more significant tumors compared to non carriers so, so next one is the prevention so Uh, commonly prevention is the we are applying some pure target groups of patients or the general population to reduce the diseases and complication and related things so there are four types of prevention but here we are mainly looking for the chemo prevention so chemo prevention to the prostate cancer so current data do not show any effective pharmacological methods for preventing the prostate cancer but there are multiple chemo prevention strategies they have 
study. So main PCPT trial, so prostate cancer prevention trial, they mainly find the placebo versus fenospirate. Huh? So fenospirate is the uh, two inhibitor, uh, fire test type two inhibitor. So they mainly uh, fenospirate versus placebo. So they have found that uh, uh, risk is reduced by around 25%. So placebo arm, they developed the 24% of prostate cancer and fenospirate arm, they developed it around 18%, they developed the prostate cancer. I, and higher incidence of high grade prostate cancer with the fenospirate. So when we compare to placebo, there's a higher incidence of high grade prostate cancer. CA. So the is the fenospirate reduced the low grade prostate CA, but it increased the high grade prostate CA. Then other trials, the reduced trial, you know, reduced the right of prostate cancer events. So again, same placebo, it's a double blind trial, placebo versus reduced the right. So relative risk of prostate CA by 22% in um, but again, same, it increased the high incidence of high grade prostate CA. So, again, it's also not recommended by the. Uh, then, other trials to select uh, 2011 one, it's a selenium and vitamin E cancer prevention trial. So, again, there are four groups selenium versus vitamin E versus vitamin E and selenium combination and versus placebo. So finding both the vitamin E significantly increased prostate cancer incidence. However, combination treatment had no effects. And the final one is the ciprofloxacin as a prophylactic agent against prostate cancer, like a chemo uh, prevention. Because it, it, uh, ciprofloxacin, our thought is that there is a chronic inflammation due to the bacterial prostatitis. It causes the carcinogenesis. So ciprofloxacin has the two effects. One is the it reduces the bacterial infection one part, and other part, other part is increase uh, inhibits the topoisomerase isomerase two enzyme. So there are two hits to reduce the incidence in the uh, of the prostate CA. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. I think that uh, the expert panel. I can ask questions uh, regarding the screening and events and so Yeah. Over. Yeah. Well done, uh, Doctor Prasun. Uh, so, you, if you get a patient, this is seventy-year-old man, comes to you with a LUTs. Yes. Okay. So, will you do PSA or not? The DRE is normal. Yeah. Again. Seventy-year-old man. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. Got the question. Yeah. Yeah, so again, same. I will the uh, histian thorough examination. Again, I will yeah, check for the patient's lifestyle, lifestyle and the patient's quality of life and the life expectancy. But I no, no, this is a history is seventy years. All uh, history is negative. Yeah. Um, PSA, the DRE also normal. Having LUTs, will you do P PSA or not? Usually, I don't do the PSA. Yeah, very but, good. Yeah, but if the patient requesting or some other reason. That's but different, yeah. That's different. So, we don't do it, no? So, yes, it's the sir. same thing. If the 55, 60 year old man come to you with a LUTs and uh, DRE also normal, will you do PSA? Again, same, sir. No, usually we don't do the PSA. No, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the problem. So, that is, yeah. yeah. Yes. So, Thurangu, so, yeah. Yes, more than 10 years life expectancy as an opportunity screening, we can do the PSA, sir. You have to do. But 70 years, but your answer is correct. So 50, 60 years. Okay? Yes. Right. Thank you. Thank you. What is the person? What is the incidence of prostate cancer zone by zone in the prostate? You know any idea? Yeah, it's more common in the peripheral cells, sir. Uh, but I don't know the percentage, sir, actually. Percent in the peripheral. 
So it's like 70%, 20%, 5%, 70% peripheral, transitional, 20 and 5% uh, central and apical is very rare. So, Dr. Suranga, I mean, the uh, same question I'm asking you. If a patient of 70 years come to you at the uh, UK, will you do a PSA, Dr. Suranga? Uh, yes, uh, because uh, the life expectancy yes. is high in here. So, you, it is maybe a 90s or maybe 95. So, it's, uh, they have a more life expectancy. So, yeah, they, are, they are doing And uh, Hello? Uh, is it, uh, I have a question regarding this, uh, sir. Uh, Can we? If the patient yes. having a multiple, if he, if he goes, if life expectancy, have, or not only with the age, my concern, there's multiple comorbidities uh, which can decide on. Uh, there is a calculations we can apply to the life expectancy calculations uh, criteria. So in that view, the age is one matter. What the thing is, some other factors which will compromise the expectancy in that instance also i think that sometimes it will uh, it will not be a beneficial when you do the psc at 70 as if you have a heart failure patient and even uh, even because we are not going to intervene uh, active intervention if we are going no active intervention in the in the in that instance uh, uh, avoiding a psc in the 70 year old uh, is acceptable as my concern is it okay sir my my feeling is that no, that's uh, all depends on your rectal examination finding. Yeah, yeah, that's so different. Yeah, yeah. That because these are DR is benign. So whatever yeah. the uh, DR is benign, and the, we are opportunistically we are doing the yeah. thing. But the thing instance, uh, that's what I can I ask. Yeah, you. high high morbid patient. Yeah. Even Sri Lanka, we don't do PSA at the age of seventy. But uh, if a DR is abnormal, so you have to do a DR and decide. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks. Prasanna, somebody asked yes, whether you will do population-based screening or not. What will be your answer and why? Population-based screening depends on the ethnicity, race and the other factors. Sir. If it is like in the Asia, if it is a Cancer incidence of prostate cancer incidence is very low, then no need to do the population based screening. But if it is like the America, like the Western countries with the more than 100 uh, cancer incidence per 100,000 populations, then there's a benefit in using the population based screening. So, what about in Sri Lanka? Will you do or not? Do we have any screening programs in Sri Lanka? No, sir. Uh, Population-based screening program for prostate cancer, we don't have. Only opportunistic. Yeah. What is the age? Are there any age limits for that? Uh, for the opportunistic... I can't remember. Just I'm asking from you. Don't worry. <laughs> uh, for the opportunistic screening, sir, uh, usually we take as a 65 years. Daha? No, no, no. It's not. It's not. More than 50 years is considered as yes. opposite screening. When you having a risk factor, is some family history, you have to consider Afro-Caribbean or something else, 45. So if it's a strong family history, you have to consider around 40. So that is the screening guideline so all... in the European. Yeah, yes. I, I mentioned mainly, I mentioned stopping the opportunistic screening at 65. Okay. Yeah, some, oh, somebody yeah, asked a question. That. You just yeah. go with the guideline and the studies. So what you do is EA guideline says opportunistic infection more than 50 years. Should be should do PSA if it is if the patient is more than 45, if it is Afro you know, Caribbean or the, the, the family history is there. And uh, if, if the patient age is 40 and record to mutation, Record. then we have to do a PSA. That's a guideline. So yes. regarding the screening, what you want to tell is there are studies against for screening and for for screening. Like you know, you said PLCO cancer prostate screen. I mean, the studies those are against for screening. But on the other hand, yes, I mean ERSPC and Gothenburg studies are for the screening. 
after telling that, you have to tell, and according to this uh, Wilson and Jung criteria, it is not filling the prostate or PSA screening is not filling that criteria. So, I mean, population based screening is no more done, only on opportunistic uh, screening is, has been done. So, that is how you want to answer. Yes, thanks. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. We move, that, yeah. uh, we move to the next uh, lecture. Is it okay? Any questions uh, from Sir Swain, sir? Uh, is, is, is there any question Hello? in this Hello, chapter? Hello, Tawa, sir. Can you mention the trials uh, for the uh, sir, uh, towards the prostate cancer screening? Towards what? Yes, I mean, for screening is Gothenburg trial and uh, what do you call it? The other one is ERSPC, no? ERSPC. Yeah, that is four. I mean, again, okay. this is, I mean, those are few studies which has not proven that screening is not beneficial. That is the cancer cap, cap study, that's cancer prostate study, and the PLA, PLCO studies. PLCO, yeah. So you have to tell those there are studies for screening and against for screening. And, and after that, you tell that PSA screen is not fully fulfilling, fulfilling this uh, Wilson Jenner criteria. Okay, sir. Thank you. Okay, I think that uh, the time is going on. So uh, we will move on to the next uh, lecture, which is being done by the you, Madhushankar. Madhushankar, over to you, Madhushankar. Okay, I'm going to discuss about uh, prostate cancer diagnosis, which is based on PSA kinetics, imaging and biopsy. In the diagnosis of prostate cancer, it is uh, initially done by doing a clinical examination with DRV and then by PSA assessment, which is prostate-specific antigen, and then followed by biopsy and imaging and confirmation of his histopathologically. So in the DRV, uh, as we discussed that there is, by the DRV itself, that there's 18% uh, chance of diagnosis of cancer, and uh, it increases about five to 30% of eyes of more than two cancers. And the drawbacks is that uh, the organ confined cancers can be diagnosed sometimes in the DRA. And uh, it has poor sensitivity as well as, as well as specificity. And to increase the sensitivity, we, after a DRA, we can use prostate specific antigen, which is an serine based, uh, serine protease, which is secreted by the this prostatic epithelial cells which has short half, two to three days of half-life. And we all know it is organ specific, but not cancer specific, as it can rise in um, uh, other benign and other infective uh, conditions as well. And this PSA value itself sometimes doesn't mean that the patient is having cancer. So to increase the diagnosis, we can use some form of uh, derivatives of PSA to increase the sensitivity. And in the management of prostate cancer, PSA has a role in diagnosis, risk stratification, as well as in the follow-up. And we discussed these things that PSA value itself. Initially, we took it as like if it is more than four, it is highly suggestive of malignancy, less than four, it's unlikely, but it doesn't show because even though PSA is like 0 0.1, 0 0.2, it is still having a risk of cancer. And depending on PSA value, there are specific cancer risk percentage. And up to 10 nanograms per milliliter of PSA, we are not taking it as directly for our further management. We have to repeat it in a, a gap of like four weeks. Sorry, Madhushankar. Um, Hello. Uh, because I, as usual, I have started the lecture. Uh, but if we concern, uh, if any of our panel, moderator panel and expert panel, uh, is willing to ask the question and going through like that. Uh, Taza? Taza? As started, as you started, we'll continue. No? I mean, oh, yeah, oh, in oh, between, oh, students oh. Sir want to ask any, I mean, Dr. No, no. Sarango, Dr. Ravindran, yeah. No, yeah, I think you're right. right. He started, so let's go. Let's go oh, fast. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. okay, yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, then in the PSA kinetics, uh, we can use PSA velocity, PSA doubling time, and PSA density, and the ratio of free to total PSA values. And it has further derived into PSA serum markers, PHI index, 
and so in the PSA derivatives, PSA velocity and PSA doubling time, uh, in the there we uh, assess the rate of change of the PSA over the time and inverse, and for sixty to eighty five years rate uh, age, the change of 0 0.07 to 0 0.27 nanograms a year is taken as normal, and if it is more than 0.7 nanograms per ml per year, is uh, increased risk of prostate cancer. And remember, this PSA value should be done on the same lab over a period of at least 18 months. And for the PSA doubling time, there are certain criteria. It should be at least three values and four weeks minimum time gap between the readings. And all PSA values should be more than 0.2 nanograms and all values within at least 12 months. So then the PSA density, uh, PSA value should be assessed in view of the size of the prostate gland. So prostate gland size can be assessed either trust scan or a MRI. And with this uh, volume, we have to see the value of the PSA for a relation to the volume. And the val value of 0 0.09 nanograms per mil ml is considered as unlikely to have a prostate carcinoma. But if it is more than 0.1, it is significant and we have to evaluate for about malignancy. And higher this value, there is high risk of having a clinically significant prostate cancer. And it is this density is used in the clinical practice where when we do free biopsy MRI, and if it, the MRI came as pirate's free lesion, and whether to do a biopsy or not, we can use PSA density. And this graph defines that PSA density is associated with the probability of high-grade prostate cancer. And then free to total PSA ratio, this value has a limited value in the diagnosis and not included in the routine diagnostic workup. And there's no use of total serum and it doesn't use if the total serum PSA is more than 10 or in the during follow-up of a known prostate carcinoma. And there are another derivatives. There are some blood and urine biomarkers. The blood-based biomarkers are the PHI index and 4K value score. And these ISO-PSA measurements can be used, but their uh, usage is still in uh, not in practical level, but in some study level, they are now using. And urine biomarkers, there is uh, prostate cancer gene 3 and select MDX, MI prostate score, and there are a lot of urine biomarkers are now they are developing, and they will increase the sensitivity of diagnostic of prostate cancer. In the imaging of diagnosis of prostate cancer, Transpectral ultrasound scan and multi-parametric MRI is helpful. In this transpectral ultrasound, it can be used for the assessment of the prostate gland in view of size and for the help of the biopsy. And this ultrasound scan will uh, help to identify the zones of the prostate gland, thereby identify the abnormal low lesions, and it will have very helpful in where we want to target a biopsy and to take abnormal lesions. And it is not reliable in the detection of prostate cancer. And now we are, are using this multi-parametric MRI of prostate, which is, uh, uh, which is a derivative of normal MRI. There we use different phases of MRI, namely T1-weighted images, T2-weighted images, and diffusion-weighted images, and this dynamic contrast enhancement images with the contrast pre and post contrast usage. So with this MRI, there's sens pool sensitivity of 0.9 and specificity of 0.3 in the diagnosis of clinically significant ISAP3 prostate cancer. But if the prostate cancers are ISAP1, there's less sensitivity when diagnosing using MRI. And the, if the lesion is more than 10, 10 millimeter, the diagnostic accuracy is increasing. And for example, this uh, MRI, uh, usually there are different phases as I described, T1, T2, diffusion weighted and uh, dynamic contrast enhancement. Usually in T1 images are helpful to identify the pelvic skeletal anatomy, the pelvic lymph nodes, as well as seminal vesicle 
and prostatic hemorrhages. And this T2 phase is helpful to identify the abnormal areas. The peripheral malignant zone will be enhanced like hyper, in, hyper intensity and the malignant foci will be appear as hypo intensity lesions. And then we can use the contrast where uh, with the contrast, there will be early contrast enhancement that will guide the abnormal malignant areas. And they have developed a score system, which is pirate score system. Initially, the Likert score system also there. And this pirate system, they will guide which lesions to be uh, further evaluated. And uh, as I mentioned, it is less sensitive in uh, ISAP grade one and more helpful in ISAP uh, three or more lesions. And same time, MRI is helpful in the identification of anterior lesions, which can be missed with the transrectal ultrasound scan based diagnosis. And this uh, pirate system, which is, uh, there are several uh, versions and we are using this uh, second version of it. And there, if the lesions are categorized to one to five, if the lesion is three, the risk of having ISAP two or more prostate cancer is 16%. And if it is for 59%, and if it is five, it's five, 85%. So it is more helpful to guide which lesions to be biopsied. And this, this comparison between these two uh, uh, diagnostic models, the Likert system and the Pirate system, the description of scoring system is in Likert system, it's the combination of this non pre specified imaging. But in pirates, it's the evaluation of pre-specified imaging features in the defined order. And in the pirate, it's only lesion-based assessment only. But in Likert, it's patient or lesion-based both. And the implementation, pirates are used for detection only. The Likert system is for detection, the active surveillance and the recurrence and post-focal treatments as well. And uh, when, uh, the guidelines for the MR imaging in biopsy uh, usually MRI is not an initial screening tool, but if you do MRI, we can use this pirate scoring system to evaluate and for the interpretation. And this MRI can help which patients need biopsy. There's thing called MRI guided pathway. Now, majority going this way to avoid unnecessary biopsies. And uh, this, if the MRI is positive, we can use either combined targeted biopsy or MRI with systematic, systematic biopsy, thereby increase the yield of the diagnostic accuracy. And if, if we are using like repeated biopsy, MRI is always play a role to guide our biopsy. And there are trials, which is this precision trial, which concludes that uh, the MRI using uh, for biopsy is always superior to our use, uh, our conventional trust biopsy. And there are another trials like precision trial, the MRI first trial, the 4M trial, all having the conclusion MRI first is better in diagnosis of clinically significant prostate carcinoma. And then come to the prostate biopsy. Uh, with the time, prostate biopsy has invented to like digital rectal directed biopsies, later it advanced to sextant biopsy. And now in this era, we are using the guided biopsy, which is either trust, by, trust guided or MRI guided. And this also is helpful in the biopsy because we can assess the prostate as well as the zonal anatomy and abnormal areas, and we can target the abnormal areas for the biopsy. And the biopsy decision is basically depend on the PSA levels and the prostate uh, PSA density and DRA and imaging uh, findings as well as risk stratification prior to biopsy it can help to reduce the unnecessary or unwanted biopsies. And the standard of care is now ultrasound guided or the MRI targeted biopsies. And we can approach either transrectal or transperineally for a prostate biopsy. And indications as we discussed, it is elevated PSA, which is refined by the PSA refiners, as well as patients other factors and suspected DRE and symptoms of malignancy and metastatic patients and uh, detected on TUR as well. And repeated biopsy indications are once previous biopsy is negative, but is still persistently high PSA, 
and this atypical small SNA proliferations on previous biopsy, extensive prostate intraepithelial neoplasia, and uh, positive urinary prostate cancer antigen uh, gene three, and any suspicious lesions detected on MRI, and uh, sometimes uh, for the diagnosis of local recurrence after ablation. And how to prepare a patient for a biopsy? Uh, Hello. The time I am going on. Just uh, try to finish it out. Yeah. Okay. Right. Uh, for in the biopsy, we have to get the patient's consent and patient's uh, anticoagulation should be adjusted. And then we have to uh, advise the patients regarding the pros and cons and the complications of it. And usually, uh, eight course of biopsy is needed for like thirty grams of prostate. And if it is more, it's uh, ten to twelve biopsy course are needed. And we can use. Uh, various methods of uh, guidance, either ultrasound guidance or MRI guidance, or we can use cognitive fusion image, uh, guidance or this uh, direct inbo guidance as well. And uh, the antibody prophylaxis con considering the biopsies, uh, these are the EUA guidelines. They say if better go for transperineal biopsy, we have perineal cleansing as well as antibiotic prophylaxis of cephalosporin is enough and transrectal Povidonide and rectal preparations is helpful as well as fluoroquinolones as antibiotic prophylaxis. If it is uh, not uh, uh, if it is not available, then go for cephalosporin combined with aminoglycosides. And NLG6, we can use uh, this uh, periprostatic block using uh, ultrasound guidance. And same time, if you are going for transperineal, perineal NLG6 as well as periprostatic NLG6 can be used. This anesthesia doesn't show any uh, increased risk of infections. And this uh, initial guidance, this extend biopsy, they use six uh, biopsies, but with the time it is now schematic, now it is going to eight, uh, 10 and 12 biopsy protocols. And this place for repeated or saturation biopsy when the initial biopsy is not representative. And then we can use uh, MRI to uh, increase our position. And then transperineal approach is uh, they have recommend in patients who have the rectal pathologies or we can't approach through the rectum and patient, to reduce the risk of infection and to increase the sensitivity by approaching to the anterior sampling of the prostate. And when we are considering rebiopsy, transperineal approach is uh, superior. And regarding complications, we have to advise patients before the procedure regarding complications. There are a uh, set of complications. The uh, most significant complications are hematospermia more than 37%, then hematuria uh, 53%, and the other infective risk are there. They are less than 2 to 1%, and minor complications are also there. And the references are EUA, BJU, and the radiopedia. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madhushanka. Uh, with a nice presentation. Uh, the expert panel will ask the questions. So. Yeah. yeah, thank you, Madam. Actually, it's a very comprehensive lecture. So, I'm asking so, for example, if you get a patient with 60 year old gentleman having a MRI scan for around PSA 10, and it is calling as a 5x2 lesion, and uh, do, do you go in, do you have? Do you plan for a prostate biopsy in, the, in this patient? Uh, this uh, MRI pilots 2 is less risk of prostate cancer, but it's still yeah. considering PSA value, it is low risk of prostate cancer. Here I suggest the patient to repeat the PSA value in six weeks apart. Mm -hmm. It is still rising. Yeah. So normally you are doing a uh, MRI scan after six weeks of so normally you have you should that you should have a uh, uh, two two values, for yes. example, persistently ten, ten yes. or eleven. Yeah. Then uh, are you going? To... Then, sir, I'll discuss with the patient that uh, patients having uh, low risk of having clinically significant prostate cancer, but still yeah. there's a uh, risk of clinical insignificant. I sub one uh, prostate cancer, which is not going to do much of a harm, but discussing mm -hmm. these pros and cons, I will avoid going for a biopsy. So and then prostate, with, volume, yeah, prostate volume is 100. Uh, then uh, I will uh, get the PSA derivative, which is uh, PSA yeah. density. 
and if the psa mm-hmm. density is significant obviously it should be significant then uh, even though mri spirits too psa density is high so i'll go ahead with the biopsy so what is the psa density in this 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 uh, uh, psa pain prostate is 100 cc point uh, point uh, so it's point 0 uh, it's point uh, point 1 yeah so i so then are you going to do a biopsy uh, it's uh, again margin more than point 2 is significant point 1 to 2 is still there's a, a gray area uh, yeah normally it is taken as a point i, I don't know in, in uh, i normally you are taking as a point for 15 as a cut off point for psa density yes yes sir so 0.15 so in that case it is a 0.0.1 so you, you don't want to do a prostate biopsy in this case because it is a low psa density and the pirate too so if it is a more than and uh, yeah 0.15 then you can discuss with the patient regarding whether it is uh suitable for prostate biopsy or not and other thing is so now the psa is 10 and then 5x2 now you decided to not to go for a prostate biopsy then you are discharging uh, the patient to your gp so what is your target psa uh the gp can monitor your psa and they can re refer to the urology team at what level you, they have to refer uh so you need to mention the target value to refer yes. back to your when the psa density is more than 0.15 so the target value would be a psa more than 15 so you need to mention in your letter that this is the value then re uh, refer otherwise they will do another psa test in one uh, one month time if it is 11 then they they will re refer to you so it is unnecessary refer so you need to yes. you can wait until f- more than 15 so that is the value of the mri scan and the psa density so that is the, that's why you are taking the psa density in the mri yes sir and uh, uh, and uh, another comment is uh, yeah in the pirate tree normally we cause for a prostate biopsy yeah if it is a uh, psa density 0.15 to uh, 0.2 uh, yeah it's better to have a prostate biopsy but if it is more than 0.2 then yes it is must and uh, an other comment is uh, you mentioned that uh, the trust by up to now actually the they are going in in you with they are move on to get a tp biopsy transperineal biopsy rather than having a trust biopsy now uh, because of the complication and the detection rate is high in the transperineal prostate biopsy and uh, previously actually uh, it was done it like a Uh, there is a grid to have a, a template biopsy now actually they are doing in a easy way so they have a entry there are two entry points uh, in the perineum and then uh, they will take the uh, six biopsy from each lobe uh, sing- with the single entry point so not like a, a template biopsy so it is very easy now uh, for transperineal prostate biopsy yes Okay, uh, Dr. Madhushankar, yeah. so small question, eh? yeah, in the same, same case, it's a 60, that's around Dr. Suranga's case, if your DRE is abnormal, it's around T2C or T, T2C, yeah? Yes. Will you do the bio, MRI or biopsy? Uh, so you got my the, question, yeah? Yeah, DRE is abnormal, PSA value, sir, is still, it is more than 0.15 density, sir. So, uh, yeah, you'll just leave it around 12 something. Right. PSA uh, is 12, 60 years, DRET to C. What is the next step? Uh, we see patients like that, no? Yes. Yeah. Uh, in our scenario, sir, we are uh, proceeding with a biopsy because our DRE and PSA is concordant. It is more than 30% risk of uh, malignancy. Uh, it, the sensitivity increased more than 80%, sir. So, we so can will go... you do the MRI and do the biopsy? or? Is it... Yeah, it's an ideal setup. Yeah, if you do a MRI and uh, biopsy or just a biopsy. Yeah, yeah, it is optional. In our, it's, if it is ideal setup, I'll discuss with the patient. There are two aspects. MRI path where we can do MRI and we can sometimes mm-hmm. avoid being doing a biopsy. So facilities and patients concerned, I'll go for MRI. 
and as a spirit lesion then go for a biopsy sir. right and if the patient is 70 year years 70 years uh, dr is t to c will you do mri and biopsy or just a biopsy or don't know biopsy uh, they are not only the age i consider the patients like uh, as we discussed earlier patients uh, uh, more than 15 years of life expectancy and uh, discuss with the patient the pros and cons of being positive of a prostate cancer and then mm -hmm. after discussing i'll go ahead with the biopsy if patients those factors are uh, suitable yeah so you do biopsy without mri you know uh, yes sir yeah so if the patient 60 years with the comorbidities a uh, recent bypass or something uh, come with the same scenario uh, psa 12 uh, dret to c will you do mri and biopsy or just a biopsy or no biopsy uh, in the long run, we are not going to achieve any uh, yeah, uh, yeah, okay, oral yeah. survival, so no point of evaluating that patient, sir. Just yeah. wait for it. Okay, thanks. <laughs> but, sir, if you are referring to radiotherapy, referring for radiotherapy, they might ask CT or MRI, right? Yeah, they won't ask MRI. They may ask CT just for a staging. That, that also still, I don't know what is the value. But MRI, if the patient is going for some radical treatment like radical prostate, yeah. then we can uh, yeah, justify doing uh, MRI. That's what I put uh, the comorbidity patient. Patient with comorbidities, uh, he is not suitable for radical treatment. So he may go for a radiotherapy or active surveillance, something or some watchful waiting. Just add a few things to, I mean, Dr. Surangas and Dr. Aravind, and things. What uh, the EAU 2024 has updated this MRI. So number one, what they are telling is if the disease is organ confined only, you do prostate by MRI. For example, if the PSA is more than 50, DRE or you know, advanced disease and patient is not fit for curative treatment, no need of MRI and no need of systematic biopsy also. Just I mean, limited biopsy, number one. Number two, you do MRI, and then if it, it is coming as pirates 405, you have to do targeted and perilational biopsy. So the perilational biopsy they have introduced because, you know, around the radius of 10 to 15 millimeter diagnosis of uh, cancer rate is high, like, you know, 90 percentage. So they have introduced targeted and perilational biopsy. No need of systematic biopsy for pirates 4 and 5. If it comes as pirates 2, then you have to go for the density, family history, and DRE finding. If they are normal, no need of biopsy, discharge the patient, as Dr. Saranga said, back to GP for PSA monitor. And if it is, I mean, if the, if the DRE or family history is there, if there is suspicion of prostate cancer, then you have to do a systematic biopsy for pirates 2. If the patient comes as pirates 3, I mean, memory of pirates 3, then earlier it has, I mean, EAU 2023 considered pirates 3 as significant. Now they don't consider significant cancer, but you have to have suspicion of cancer if the MRI has pirates 3. So abnormal DRE, family history, and PSA density is less than, I mean, more than 0.1, then you have to do targeted and perilational biopsy. That is how they have uh, uh, MRI and biopsy, they have uh, updated 2024. So as Dr. Aravindan said, uh, if the DRE advanced disease, if the PSA is more than 50, the patient is not fit for a curative treatment, no need of MRI, just go for limited biopsy and treatment. Pirates 4 and 5, targeted perilational biopsy. What they are telling is perilational biopsy. I mean, identifying of uh, clinically significant cancers are high and need of, or we can limit the number of course so that, you know, no need to, you know, uh, uh, take a biopsy from the opposite lobe. So, I mean, risk of infection and complication is less. So, pirates four and five, targeted and perilational biopsy. Two and three, depending on the suspicion, we have to decide if they are positive, pirates two, systematic biopsy, pirates three, targeted and perilational biopsy. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> and the patient is going for curative, curative intention, then we do a MRI. 
no dag yes curative uh, yeah. intent yes yeah is for the patient is for is suitable for intent, radical radical uh, and uh, organ confined disease yeah organ confined yeah yeah well summarized yeah your biopsy coming as two cause of high grade pin what is the next step you are going to do two cause uh, positive or high grade pin no other malignancies uh with a uh, high grade pin sir there is a risk of 80% risk of having associated uh, significant prostate cancers so i will uh, go for a mri and assess the prostate well and go for a systematic biopsy consider re biopsy so what they're telling is i mean acidacel proliferation it's 40% for high grade pin only 24% and you have to repeat biopsy if more than three cores are positive so the scenario was only two cores so it is not significant but it's a high grade Other. grade of the high grade pin yeah Oh. Yeah. For uh, other thing is a uh, for example, you are doing a T U R for uh, another sixty five year gentleman, and yeah, they, you found a Gleason score six prostate cancer. So yes. in the T U R three chips. So how do you manage the, in this patient? So uh, so it is. Uh, Gleason six. It means I sub one cancer, which is now clinically uh, not significant prostate cancer. And I uh, hope we have done a PSA before TURP, and it is organ confined. So uh, we can uh, 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 inform the patient, and then we can uh, uh, do the active surveillance of the prostate cancers. Uh, the problem is the prostate cancer is arise from the peripheral zone, but non you are cutting in. You are the transitional zone, so but we can miss the significant prostate cancer in the periphery. Uh, and then uh, in, 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 they, in, in two years time they will come with the metastatic lesion, and then uh, they they will argue with you regarding why did why didn't you do any other things with the TUR uh, once you diagnose TUR in the prostate cancer in TUR. Yes. Uh, in that scenario, so we can do a MRI uh, with a given after a few time to see any uh, pirate lesions in the peripheral zone, and then go for yes. targeted biopsy. Yes. yes, you have to do MRI scan in the uh, the peripheral uh, the uh, biopsy for confirmation because the seventy percent of the prostate cancer arise from the peripheral zone. Now yes. uh, you yes. incidentally found that some cancer in the transitional zone, but you need to. Uh, do a proper workup for identify identification of the, uh, the cancer in the patient. Well. Yes. So I I have one question. Uh, so long as, uh, the, regarding the uh, doing MRI, how long it takes? Around six weeks at least. We have doctor TURP. Yeah, 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 at least six weeks. Yeah. One uh, yeah, four weeks to six weeks. You need to wait for a, a time for a information to settle and then do a MRI scan and the biopsy. Capsule biopsy okay. we have to take. That. Yeah. Yes. Anchor. Yes, sir. What do you mean by clinically significant cancer? We all talk about that. Yes. Uh, when the prostate cancer is eyes up uh, three or more, they are considered as clinically significant cancer. Uh, but in some guidelines, they talk about eyes up two or more as well. But uh, if it's three or more cancer is considered as eyes, uh, clinically significant prostate cancers. Any any other things? Yeah, I sub or seven or more. Gleason score seven or more. I sub three or more. And volume. Mm -hmm. Volume is more than five, zero point five. Or if there is an extra organal or extra prostate extension, those uh, those are called clinically significant. And what is the difference between pirates four and five? Mm -hmm. Is it the image difference or the any other difference? How do they differentiate pirates four and five? Uh, it is the volume of the lesions. I mean, uh, the volume is if the volume is more than one point five, if it is extending beyond the prostate, that is pirate five. It's five because imaging is both are same for pirates four and five. Uh, yes. 
and uh, you talked about this you, this precision and promise by promise uh, trials so yeah. promises for this mri before biopsy and precision is for this mri targeted biopsy well supported by this uh, precision yes uh, the trans vector biopsy versus mri yes. biopsy that's a guided biopsy is better than uh, just systematic biopsy that is i mean defended by or proven by sorry proven by uh, precision trial precision so then sir yeah. no i think i think you have covered stuff no questions from me yeah we'll proceed uh so in the absence of questions, uh, I would like to introduce the next lecture. Uh, the treatment of prostate, lo uh, prostate carcinoma in localized to prostate CA. So done by the during the disorder. So over to you, Dunit. Uh, now uh, just uh, just wait. Uh, before starting a uh, lecture, do I are we going to? Ask the question from the localized prostatic scenario and go ahead to doing the lecture, sir. Uh, sorry, sir. I'm asking from the expert panel and other moderator. Yeah, no, I think I think we'll we, we'll ask him to uh, present it uh, probably uh, in about ten minutes. Do it oh, fast okay. and okay. leave the questions afterwards. Yeah. Okay. Okay, sir. Uh, hope you can see my screen. Yeah, carry on. Yeah. Yes, Doctor. Yeah, carry on, please. Yeah. So I'm going to discuss the management of uh, localized prostate carcinoma, and uh, so you all are familiar with this EU risk group for biochemical recurrence. This is in the EU guidelines and based on BMCO risk specification, which includes a clinical examination, that mainly DRE findings and PSA and VSA score. And they have divided into low risk, intermediate risk and high risk uh, categories. Depend PSA value less than 10, VSA score less than seven and clinically T1 and T2A. Uh, and intermediate risk T between 10 to two and VSA score seven and uh, clinical stage in T2B. And uh, anything more than this considered as high risk. And that there are other risk stratification systems as well. One is CAPRA and NCCN and uh, MSKCC and this new Cambridge prognostic uh, group classification. Uh, this is a new Cambridge prognostic group for non metastatic prostate cancer risk stratification group. And uh, so depending on the uh, each risk stratification risk group, there are management options available. So for the low risk, all the management options are available, watchful waiting, active surveillance, uh, radiotherapy. And for the intermediate risk, again, watchful waiting, active surveillance, and radical treatment options are available. But for the high risk group, uh, we have the watchful waiting and uh, radical treatment. So before deciding the management of uh, locally, uh, localized prostate cancer, cancer, it is uh, important to evaluate the life expectancy and the health state of the patient to decide on the uh, management options available for that particular patient. So for, to decide the life expectancy, there are life expecting uh, tables are available, especially for European mates. And then health status screening, then there are several screening tools. Uh, geriatric screening, eight screening tool, as well as the clinical fatality scale, which is uh, given in the EU guidelines. And uh, with that, we can assess the patient's performance score as well. Uh, so we have seen this, uh, this uh, they have mentioned about uh, prostate cancer intervention versus observational trial. They have, they, I'm going to discuss three trials uh, regarding the localized prostate cancer management. And this is again an American study uh, which has uh, compared the watchful waiting versus the radical surgery in localized prostate cancer. And they have found that the, um, there was no oral survival or cancer specific survival difference between two arms. Mm -hmm. And SPCG4 trial, again, a Scandinavian study, again, in pre PSA era. Uh, they have again randomized radical prostatectomy and watchful waiting uh, patients. And they have found that radical prostatectomy provides superior cancer specific survival and overall survival. And 
compared to the watchful waiting. However, this is benefited only after 10 years. So again, protect free trial, again, another randomized control trial. They have randomized uh, patients into three hours, active surveillance, radical prostatectomy, and radiotherapy. And uh, they have found that the active surveillance is effective as active treatment. So we come to the active surveillance. So the aim of this active surveillance is to uh, avoid the unnecessary treatment related toxicity to the patient. So uh, during active surveillance, patient remains under close surveillance through structured surveillance program. So we are monitoring the patient with PSA levels, clinical examination, mainly digital examination, and MRI and repeat biopsies. So we offer the patient curative treatment once the patient receives, uh, once we diagnose that the disease is progressing or patient receives predetermined thresholds. So for the patient to be uh, selected for active surveillance, and because uh, there are no active prospective randomized control trials, uh, selection criteria for active surveillance is limited. So available uh, criteria are patients to be ISOC grade 1 or clinical stage T1C or T2A, and PSA should be less than 10, and PSA W time has to be 0.15. So in the EU guidelines, uh, the MRI imaging for selection of active surveillance is also there. And men who are eligible for active surveillance uh, based upon systematic biopsy alone uh, uh, without rebiopsy MRI uh, should be rebiopsied within 6 to 12 months to exclude uh, sampling errors. So this is, they have mentioned it at confirmatory biopsy. And they have mentioned uh, some exclusion criteria for this uh, active surveillance depending on the pathology consensus group. Predominant ductal carcinoma, from histology against sarcomatoid carcinoma, uh, and extra prostatic extension, infiltration in the needle biopsy, those are considered as exclusion criteria. So, the active surveillance management, again, they have discussed different regimes for the NICE guideline and EAU guidelines. So, the NICE guideline, they have mentioned uh, PSA is recommended for the, every three months for the first year and then six monthly and PSA doubling time and the velocity and the digital rectal examination is uh, for every six monthly until the end of fourth year and annually after that. And they have suggest to do the uh, prostate biopsy at the end of 12 months uh, of active surveillance and uh, after that they are not routinely uh, suggest prostate biopsy uh, unless the PSA starts rising or at that point, we have to do a MRI or repeat bias. According to EAU guidelines, uh, again, the same serial digital examinations and PSA at least every six monthly. And they also suggest the repeat biopsy if there's a PSA progression or there's a change in the PSA kinetics. So the change in the management in acute surveillance, if there's a PSA doubling time less than two years and re if the rebiopsy Kind of primary lesion score is above four or above, and if there are more than fifty percent of the scores are positive, uh, uh, need to change uh, management. So, a, a patient with uh, a PSA change alone is not an indication for uh, changing the management. It has to be followed by uh, imaging and the biopsy. So, the other available option is a radical prostatectomy. It involves a removal of the prostate with the capsule and the seminal vesicles and with vesicular anastomosis. So, complications of radical prostatectomies are the mortality is about 1%, and the main com problematic uh, complications are the impotence and the incontinence. And there's a 5% risk of rectal injuries as well. So, uh, uterine incontinence of radical prostatectomy is uh, another troublesome complication. Usually about 50% uh, of the patients will end up with uh, mild urine incontinence, but at the end of one and a half years, about 10% will have long-term incontinence following radical prostatectomy. So uh, if the patient is persisting having urine incontinence after 12 months of radical prostatectomy, then the available options are the urethral bulking agents, valvular strings, and the artificial urinary uh, sphincters. And uh, but we have to make sure that the patient may be having a bladder stenosis or detrusor activity associated with the incontinence. So we have to do the flow rate uh, and urodynamics prior to do any interventions. So risk of impotence after radical prostatectomy is about uh, fifty percent. So if you are done the uh, unilateral now sparing radical prostatectomy, it's about fifty percent. If you go for a bilateral, uh, then uh, it's about sixty percent. So. For the importance, uh, 
available postoperative alternatives are there. You can start postoperative stress five inhibitors and intrauteral intrauteral intracavernosal prostaglandins and the vacuum pumps. So, and again, the contraindications of now spare and radical prostatectomies are the, the palpable disease, apical tumor extension, and high risk lesions eight or more uh, is considered as a contraindication for uh, now spare and radical prostatectomy. Bit of uh, or in the pelvic limb node dissection, and they were demonstrated that the performing pelvic limb node dissection during radical prostatectomy failed to improve the oncological outcome. So, two randomized control trials also there to show no benefit of extended apertures limited pelvic limb node dissection on early oncological outcomes. Uh, so, extended pelvic limb node dissection provides, but it provides accurate information about the staging and the prognosis. So. Extending pelvic limb node dissection includes uh, removal of the nodes overlying the external iliac artery and the vein, and nodes within the obturator fossa, and uh, nodes medial and lateral of the internal iliac artery. So, a bit of about uh, lymph node positive patients during radical breast. So, they have co cohort studies, they have shown that the uh, survival of not positive patients shows that radical prostatectomy may have a survival benefit over abandonment of radical prostatectomy in not positive cases. Uh, then the method of the radical prostatectomy, the open laparoscopic or robotic radical prostatectomy, and the evidence shows that the, whatever the technique, uh, uh, oncological outcome is same. And but uh, if you're going for a laparoscopic and robotic, it seems better for hospital stay, transfusion rates, and postoperative pain. And again, there's no proven benefit using a, a laparoscopic robotic or improves long-term incontinence or. Uh, erectile dysfunction. And regarding the surgical techniques, management of the dorsal venous flexes, they have found that the, whether they go for a ligation or vascular staplers, uh, there's no oncological outcome. Only thing is you can reduce the blood loss with the uh, vascular uh, staplers. They have found that in one study. And regarding the nerve sparing surgery, preservation of the neurovascular bundles with parasympathetic nerves, branches of the pelvic flexes can uh, spare the erectile function. And uh, then regarding the seminal vesicle removal, complete seminal vesicle removal is the default practice, but uh, can preservation of the tip of seminal vesicles may be considered in low risk conditions. And, uh, but there's no difference in marginal status or PSA recurrence or continence or erectile function outcomes. Then the techniques of anastomosis, uh, direct vesicular erectile anastomosis end-to-end Intermucosal anastomosis of bladder neck to the membranous urethra by six intra sutures is the uh, recommended one. And regarding the bladder neck mucosal inversion, eversion, non randomized study showed no significant difference in the uh, anastomotic stricture rates, whether you go for eversion or not. And then the bladder neck preservation, the majority of the urinary continuous is. Uh, by the external urethral sphincter at the membrane urethra, but uh, there's a minor component is contributed from the internal sphincter as well at the bladder neck. So preservation of the bladder neck has therefore been proposed to improve the continuous recovery post radical prostatectomy. So oh, urethral length preservation, preservation of the urethral length as much as possible during radical prostatectomy will maximize the chance of early return to continence. So that's again the complications of laparoscopic and robotic and uh, radical prostatectomy. So uh, another uh, uh, next option is the radiotherapy. So you can give radiotherapy as external beam radiotherapy, as a low dose and high dose brachytherapy, and the photon therapy. So photon therapy is more precise, very expensive, and uh, evidence shows that there's no toxicity or cancer control benefit compared to the intestinal motivated radiotherapy. So uh, Quickly rushing through the two different modes of brachytherapy. Again, low dose and high dose. Low dose, you permanently implant the seeds and radiation dose is delivered over weeks. So high dose, again, you temporarily implant and radiation dose is delivered within minutes. So complications associated with uh, brachytherapy, again, a patient might develop irritative, un unbearable voiding LUTs and urinary incontinence, again, retention and uh, erectile dysfunction as well. So contraindications are if the patient is having coagulation disorders, uh, previous pelvic radiation, and previous TURPs, if the space is having large prostate with a large medial lobe, again, contraindicated for brachytherapy. So complications of radiotherapy are 
patient will get cystitis, hematuria, proctitis, proctitis, and again, here the urine content is about 1%, and uh, erectile dysfunction is about 25 to 60% when compared to the radical prostatectomy. So the next option is the watchful waiting. The aim watch, uh, watchful waiting is to balance the potential harms of and the benefits of early hormone treatment. So patients are clinically watched for development of the local and systemic symptoms. So when they develop local and systemic symptoms of the prostate cancer, we uh, manage them accordingly and palliate them and to improve the quality of life. So the traditional uh, method was to uh, wait until the patient develops symptoms. But however, we have evidence that uh, early hormonal treatment could prolong the short-term survival for locally advanced diseases. That is Sorry, for patients uh, with... Yeah. Sorry to you, uh, disturb you, but just uh, you are over, going on over the time. Just try to finish yeah. it out early. Yeah. Uh, but, actually, this is my last slide. Uh, so, again, the... Uh, Bit of investigational therapy again, high intensity focus also is there, and cryotherapy for whole gland, those are mainly uh, 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 not recommended at, at the moment. So, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dunita. Very uh, comprehensive lecture you are given, very nice lecture. And I think that uh, uh, expert panel and the other uh, supportive staffs can ask the questions. Uh, thank you, Dunika. Actually, a nice presentation. Uh, how can you decide the treatment options and the manage, uh, like a management plan and the investigation according to the claim which prognostic group risk specification? Because this is the this is the uh, risk stratification now. Uh, I think hopefully it will come into the nice guideline very shortly. So now they are widely practiced in here rather than DMECO or in uh, uh, DMECO. So, uh, I mean the, the people who are in the Cambridge, uh, I think led by uh, uh, Winston Nana Prakasam, they have made a uh, Cambridge uh, prognostic group five. And according to this specification, uh, how can you decide the management option and how do you decide the, uh, the investigation, uh, stage in investigation? Uh, do you have any idea? But this is the uh, uh, coming uh, 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 risk stratification. Actually, sir, we are not familiar with this Cambridge uh, stratification system, sir. Uh, hmm. So it is actually it 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 has us five groups uh, starting from like a group one is a Gleason score six uh, and PSA less than ten and T one T two. And Gleason uh, group two is uh, Gleason score three plus four, PSA ten to twenty, and T one T two, and uh, three is Gleason three plus four, and PSA ten to twenty, and T one T two, and uh, it include Gleason four plus three and T one T two as well. So group four is Gleason eight, PSA more than twenty, and uh, T three, and uh, group five is. Uh, Gleason 8 or 9 or 10 or more than uh, 20 PSA and uh, stage in T4. So it, it, they have categorized uh, group, group 1 as a low risk, 2, 3, 4 intermediate, uh, 2 is favorable intermediate, 3 is unfavorable intermediate, 4 and 5 high risk, 4 is favorable high risk, high, uh, 5 is very high risk. So, According to that risk certification, they uh, actually they made a plan. Group one more favor for active surveillance. Group two active surveillance medical options are equally distributed. So that means you can uh, offer active surveillance, radical prostatectomy, or radical radiotherapy. And group three more favor favorable for radical option, group four and five, more for a radical option. So that's how the management is uh, different according to the risk stratification. And if you go for investigation as a rough guide, and group three, four, five, you can stage by bone scan or CT, CT scan. 
group 3 is the uh, controversial so uh, some are saying uh, no no need to do a uh, bone scan for group 3 but roughly group 3 4 5 you need to do a bone scan or ct for staging and group 4 and 5 brachytherapy alone is not a treatment option so it, it should be combined with the external beam radiotherapy if you are offering for a radiotherapy for group 4 and 5 so that's how it, it is a rough guide so now i think you need uh, you need to know the cambridge prognostic group certification because now they are go- they are discussing in our mdt and they we have a, a, a separate column for cpg and it will very soon it will come to the nice guide thanks thank you thank you actually dr suranga i mean good point you, you you noted i mean this is been included in 2024 uau because what they have noted in uh, eau risk stratification was earlier they have divided t2 t1 into t21 t2 a b c which is dre finding or an mri finding which is not specific but see this cambridge prognostic group they don't take uh, a b pc just t1 t2 yeah. t3 t4 a1 t2 yeah so yeah. that is the advantage and number 2 cambridge uh, prognostic group uh, i mean uh, risk stratification is better for the overall survival whereas eau risk stratification yeah. is better for the biochemical recurrence free survival so so this cpg is included in uh, 2024 guidelines so it is better for the overall survival and as you said it will be coming for the I mean, other guidelines also yeah hopefully now it the, is trend is trend is for a cpg now uh, sorry dr sanna uh, i think the they are i think it will come to the uh, in, in our mdt also now they are they are more targeting on the cpg rather than the dmco or nc Vinutha, what about this uh, new adjuvant therapy before radical prostatectomy? So they have found that the new adjuvant uh, androgen deprivation therapy will reduce the prostate volume and the uh, positive margin rates, but uh, overall survival-wise, uh, there is no difference if you are giving uh, new adjuvant prior to the radical prostatectomy. Yes, because you know, the difference between radical prostatectomy and radiotherapy is new adjuvant therapy in radical prostatectomy the cochrane review has said uh, you know that you can reduce the positive margin local control but there's no overall survival but uh, i mean uh, but in radiotherapy the study by bola et al they have said oh uh, for the high risk and uh, locally advanced disease uh, there is a benefit in uh, new adjuvant before radical radiotherapy isn't that so yes so you have done a radical prostatectomy the margin become positive how are you going to manage so in that case uh, uh, so after the radical prostatectomy i would uh, look for the PSA value, sir. And uh, after six weeks, I will repeat the PSA and see whether the PSA has come to uh, baseline or if the PSA is high or so. Depending on that, uh, I will decide the for the management, sir. So I couldn't hear you because I am in Badul. So what I said was, sir. Uh, So I will repeat the PSA value after six weeks of the surgery and see whether the PSA has come down and if the PSA is, PSA is elevated or not. And uh, depending on that, I will decide for the uh, adjuvant therapy, sir. Sorry, Dimutha. Dimutha, I, I couldn't hear you because my reception, I mean, interrupted. I mean, Badul is famous for poor reception. Uh, yeah, as you said, this is uh, supported by that radicals RT trial. so is the post i mean no need of give no need to give uh, immediate post operative rt 
and even the margin is positive. You can monitor the PSA. If the PSA is more than 0.5, and uh, yes. you can start, I mean, 0.5 only, you can start uh, radiotherapy. And I mean, it should be less than, I mean, no need to wait, uh, wait more than one also. You have to start if the PSA is more than five. No need to five. give immediate post-operative radiotherapy. You yes. can monitor. If the lymph nodes are positive, radical prostatectomy lymph nodes are positive. Sorry, sir, I'm not sure. Uh, you have to do ADT, you know, because the reason why we are not bothered about lymph node dissection is when there is lymph node positive, that means there is micromax. There is positive uh, metastasis. That is why we don't do a proper yes. lymph node dissection. It's, I don't know whether Dr. Suranga has said this. To decide whether we are going to do a lymph node dissection always depends on this uh, nomograms. So if it is an MRI targeted biopsy, a normogram says the risk of having lymph node more than 7%, we are going to decide or do a lymph node dissection. And if postoperative lymph nodes are positive, then we have to do, we have to give ADT. We have to start ADT and regenerative therapy. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What is PSA bounds? I don't know whether you have discussed my yeah. phone was interrupted uh, in between. PSA bounds means uh, it's a benign rise of uh, PSA uh, following a radical hysterectomy. Uh, so even after radical radiotherapy as well, sir, it's a benign elevation of PSA values. Well, it's not, yeah. Is it after radical prostatectomy or radiotherapy? Yeah, it should be a radical radiotherapy set. So it is benign rise and it should be less than 1.5. Normally it's happened in 9 months to 18 months. You know? yes. How will you decide a recurrence after a radical prostatectomy? How would you define a recurrence? Uh, so there are several definitions. Uh, so if uh, if the if the PSA value is more than two nanograms per milliliters milliliter uh, above the Hello? Uh, minimum value after post radical prostatectomy, so that is one definition. And if there are three consecutive values uh, with high PSA, again can say it's a recurrence. So, recurrence means uh, different for radical prostatectomy and radical radiotherapy. For radical prostatectomy, if the PSA is more than 0.2 is enough. 0 0.2 we call as, uh, uh, I mean, uh, recurrence. So number one is more than 0.2 PSA. Number two, biopsy positive as at anastomotic site. Number three, distant metastasis. If those three are there, we can label as recurrence after radical prostatectomy. But after radical radiotherapy, recurrences are Number one, uh, PSA more than 2 plus nadir. If the nadir is 0.4, if the PSA is 2.4, we can call as recurrence. That is 2 plus nadir value. Uh, nadir. That is one. Number two is positive prostate biopsies, but it should be done after 18 months of radiotherapy. If you give a radiotherapy and if you do a biopsy in three months, if it comes positive, that is not recurrence. And the number three is distant metastasis as OPS. So those are the recurrences for radical radiotherapy and uh, radical prostatectomy. So what is undetectable PSC? So what is the value for undetectable PSC? Sorry, sir, I'm not sure the value is. Less than 0.02. 1, 1. 1, 1. There is a, I just I want to ask something. Like a super sensitive PSA. It's a, some, now there were term called super sensitive PSA where the sensitive is 0 0.0, uh, 0 0.003. 
is it using uh, sir actually there is a concept called super sensitive psa uh, which is using after the radical therapies uh, then uh, if it is considered as a, point, as a three decimals it means 0 0.003 is it ever used uh, in uh, european countries so it actually it is not commonly used actually because rather than depending on these these values it may be highly selective cases they might use normally not seen actually not a frequent thing vinuta what is the indication for psma pet sorry sir, i didn't get the question sir indication for place of psma pet in prostate cancer management when would you do so i didn't hear the question sorry psma pet uh, psma pet PSMA PET scan, but what is the in, uh, indication for the PSMA PET? So he's asking. Sorry, sir, I'm not sure that. So if the PSA is more than 0.2 after radical prostatectomy, so you suspect an uh, recurrence somewhere. Recurrence. So to detect that, uh, you do a PSA, PSMA PET. And uh, newly, they have said uh, in even in intermediate and high risk patients, localized even localized or locally advanced patient you do a psma pet so if you see a metastasis you can defer the management you can you can you know change the management so initially you can do psma pet in intermediate to high risk patients or else after rp if the psa is rising more than 0.2 in australia they are doing uh, as a stage in process in psma pet uh, initially but in uh, UK, they are doing that. I have mentioned for a uh, uh, ESA is more than 0 0.2 after the session, but in Australia, they are doing actually initial work. Okay, yeah. And other thing is, how, how do you uh, follow up with, for X2 surveillance? Are you doing always the biopsy or MRI? So we are following up with the uh, clinical examination, mainly digital exam examination, then the PSA uh, values and uh, PSA values. Sir. So mm -hmm. different regimes are there. So uh, what the USA suggests is a PSA three monthly for first year and then six monthly at least. And with the digital examination, clinical examination. And uh, if there's a, if you the PSA doubling time is uh, less than two or uh, if there's rising the PSA value, then you go for re-imaging and biopsy, sir. Do you do protocol MRI scan in like a 12 months, 12 to 18 months? Yeah, at the at the onset of active surveillance, at the end of uh, 12 months, you do for uh, repeat first biopsy, sir. Yeah, but the biopsy was replaced by MRI scan, so you need to do a, a protocol MRI scan. In 12 to 18 months. During this period, we need to do an MRI scan and then say whether it is stable MRI scan in comparison to the last one. So if it is stable, then you can continue your PSA Okay, So are there any questions? What are the contraindications for EB, uh, radiotherapy, Tinuta? Uh, I think you might have oh, discussed. I don't know whether I have missed yeah. it. So, if the patient has received previous uh, pelvic radiation, or if the patient is having uh, uh, inflammatory bowel disease like conditions, uh, so those are the main uh, contraindications for radiotherapy, sir. And severe LUTs, no? L yeah. LUTS. Just a quick question. Uh, we, we urologists are called upon to handle uh, once the radiotherapy is given, sometimes complications come and we are asked to manage them. How would you manage a patient who's got... Uh, 
post radiation cystitis or uh, and proctitis can you just quickly outline so we can uh, so it depends on the severity sir if the patient is having a uh, mild cystitis frank hematuria uh, he's having frank hematuria three or four months down the line and uh, your patient is referred to you what are you going to do so um, so first i will assess with the flexible scissors officer and okay. see whether we can go for an intravesical therapy sir uh, so what what i what are you going to use so i can uh, use in uh, intravesical uh, formally and uh, then uh, if he's not responding for intravesical therapy there's place for uh, embolization for the control bleeding sir in, uh, before you put formalin is there anything that you just when you're doing uh, that you like to know yeah, we do exclude the reflux whether the patient is having a reflux. Okay, yeah. And uh, if there is a lot of post radiation proctitis, is, is there a lot of symptoms? Is there anything you can do as, uh, as, as a urologist? Somebody else will be giving radiotherapy. Unfortunately, we have to manage the complications. So, what are you going to do? So, I'm not sure, sir. So they've given radiation, and there's a lot of uh, symptoms of radiation proctitis. How will you manage this? Uh, sorry, sir, I don't know that. Local steroids can be given. Yeah, that's right. I mean, you have to think of uh, giving transrectal enemas, uh, steroids. There are there are things you'll have to basically do because uh, ra radiologists will run away. Otherwise, you can uh, involve your GI colleagues. What they right. always do is to uh, give transrectal uh, steroids. Suranga, anything? Can you add a little anything there? Anything new, Suranga? Okay, in the absence of not, that. Not, not, not much, not much. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. Okay. Right. In the absence of that, yeah, we'll proceed, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you, Dunita. Right, next we'll move on to the general discussion, uh, which is done by the, uh, uh, the Sehan Ratnak. Over to you, Sehan. I hope you can see my uh, slides. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, uh, so uh, the article that I'm discussing today is titled uh, Prostate Cancer Screening with PSA and followed by uh, MRI, targeted by uh, Ulfman B, which is an article uh, published in 2022 in the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, it is also termed the Gothenburg 2 trial, uh, which is a Swedish trial, uh, which is a population based randomized screening trial. A bit about the background. Uh, as we already discussed, population screening of prostate cancer is burdened with a high rate of overdiagnosis. And uh, this overdiagnosis is seen as the main obstacle that in recommending uh, population screening. Uh, the reason for this is that there's a very high prevalence of small, low grade prostate cancer in the adult population. It can be up to about 50% in the age more than 60 uh, group. And these tumors in, uh, are actually indolent tumors. 
and they have uh, slow and even no progression over time sometimes. And uh, the PSA, as we already discussed, is an organ specific uh, marker, not a tumor specific marker. Uh, these trials have already been discussed, and there are trials for and against uh, uh, population screening. And uh, the newer trials have shown that there's no mortality benefit offered by uh, population screening. But they have all confirmed uh, that there's over diagnosis of disease. So, with that in mind, this trial has been uh, uh, started, and the it is a, a population based randomized screening trial. And the objective has been to offer MRI to all patients who are, who have an elevated PSA of more than three, rather than going directly uh, with systematic biopsies, and uh, to do targeted biopsies and see whether the clinically significant cancers are detected and the insignificant cancers are reduced. Uh, the inclusion criteria of this trial is that they have included men from 50 to 60 years of age to a population screening register. Uh, and they have included the Gothenburg as well as 10 other municipalities. And this was done during 2015 to 2020 time period. And patients who already have prostate cancer and patients who have already died or immigrated during this period of randomization have been excluded. So they have, uh, the patients have received a PSA test at their primary care facility. And then afterwards, they have been randomized into three trial groups. Uh, the reference group is the uh, group that has, uh, had PSA of more than three, and they are, they do undergo an MRI, but they were followed by systematic biopsy, uh, regardless of the MRI findings. And if they do have a pirate score of three to five uh, lesions, which are detected in the MRI, in addition to the systematic biopsies, they underwent targeted biopsies as well. The trial group two and three uh, are people who actually are the uh, experimental group who had a PSA of more than three and they undergo targeted biopsies if the PSA is, if the MRI is positive for uh, suspicious lesions, which are PIRS 3 and above lesions. The trial group 3 actually is not included in the, the trial uh, uh, document. Regarding the MRI, they have done a multi-parametric MRI using a three Tesla machine, and then uh, three radiologists have uh, reported each uh, MRI, and two of them at least should have a consensus regarding the findings. Uh, the suspicious lesions that they have considered are pirates three and above, and uh, they were uh, the location has been given according to twenty four sector template, and then hundred of these examinations have been done by an external validate uh, external examination as well to validate. All these patients have undergone a clinical evaluation, including a DRE and a transrectal ultrasound. And uh, regarding the biopsy, systematic biopsy had included 10 to 12 cores of trust biopsies, which has been done. And uh, the targeted biopsies has included four cores of the uh, suspicious areas. Uh, the PSA, they have done the P total PSA value at a central laboratory. And uh, the prostate uh, specimens, again, has been looked at by one experienced pathologist and two uh, uh, other external uh, pathologists to validate it. And uh, the final lesion score was, uh, uh, was given by the, uh, should be uh, uh, concordant between at least two uh, pathologists. They have looked at adverse events uh, using an electronic questionnaire. And then trial outcomes, they have looked at the primary outcome, that is the percentage of clinically insignificant uh, prostate cancer, which is a three plus three for, according to their trial. And then the secondary outcome was to look at clinically significant prostate cancer. So uh, they have calculated the sample size to be 36,000 men. Uh, and these are criteria that they have used with 80% power. And they have looked at a uh, 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 p value of 0 0.05. And uh, they have uh, analyzed according to intention to treat as well as per protocol analysis. And uh, as I told, uh, the 0 0.05 p value has been taken as a significant level. Uh, these are the results of the study. So they have invited 38,775 men, but uh, after uh, inclusion and exclusion criteria as well as response to invitation, they have ultimately had 17,980 patients. Uh, they were randomized to a reference group as well as the experimental group. And then patients who have a PSA of more than three had undergone MRI followed by either systematic biopsy or a targeted biopsy. Of this, uh, about 47% patients have responded to their uh, 
uh, invitations and uh, about 86% of the patients from the reference group has undergone biopsies of the indicated uh, biopsies and then in the experimental group about 90% of patients who have indicated to have indications to have biopsy had undergone a biopsy uh, regarding the population characteristics uh, about uh, 7% of the whole study population has had a PSA of more than 3. That was uh, common to both groups. And uh, more than 10 PSA was seen close to 1% of patients. So these are the, the intention to treat analysis uh, report of the study. So clinically insignificant cancer in the reference group has been 1.2%. And the experimental group it has been 0.6%. So uh, the relative risk was 0.46 uh and uh, the range uh, the confidence interval was 0.3 to 0.6 so it was statistically significant uh, the reduction in uh, clinically insignificant cancer there's a reduction in clinically significant cancers as well uh, it was uh, one uh, 0.1 in the reference group but 0.9 in the experimental group but this was not clinically significant uh, regarding the the safety of uh, biopsies in them uh the the, 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 the complications have been quite less in this study compared to the normal population. It has all been there for less than 0.1 percent, and uh, antibiotics have been given as outpatients for less than 0.1 percent of the group in the referent, as well as uh, 0.03 in the experimental group. At the same time, hospitalizations have also been very low. Uh, so, in these patients, uh, in, uh, in my discussion on uh, in these, uh, there's a reduction, 54% reduction of the clinically insignificant cancers in the uh, experimental group compared to the uh, reference group. And these uh, small lesions, 3 plus 3 tumors, are the main contributors to uh, uh, over diagnosis. And the problem of over diagnosis is people offset the benefit of screening. And uh, we will end up treating patients who have uh, malignancies, which will never become a problem. Of uh, progress during the individual's lifetime. So uh, there's a considerable, uh, at the same time, since we are only doing uh, MRI-based targeted biopsies, the number of biopsies that we are doing is also reduced in this trial. Uh, but even though there's a significant, statistical significant reduction in the number of clinical insignificant cancers, still 38% uh, of the malignancies are lesion 3 plus 3. But what has been found is that uh, the MRI detected lesion 3 plus 3 tumors tend to be larger, and they, in fact, are actually uh, can be tumors which are clinically more significant compared to the ones that are not detected in the uh, in MRI. And the clinically significant cancers, 19% reduction in the clinically significant cancers were there, but that is not statistically significant. Additionally, 10 patients have uh, actually been uh, detected to have prostate CA uh, in the reference to group uh, from systematic biopsies, not in the MRI. So these are the ones which have been missed, in, missed on MRI, but uh, they were only very small malignancies. And uh, even though they have lesion 3 plus 4, the 4 component has been less than 5%. So uh, majority of them have undergone active surveillance. So, uh, the, the inference is that these are Malignancies even uh, with a uh, delayed diagnosis would not have any prognostic uh, uh, difference. Uh, so the sense of this study is that it's a very large uh, sample size study and it's a population-based screening study. And uh, they have done external validation uh, uh, at the uh, pathology level as well as radiology level to uh, reduce diagnostic bias. And uh, the standardization of uh, template bias template has done to reduce something bias as well. But the weaknesses are it's a single center study and it has only included young patients of 50 to 60, so its generalizability is questionable. And uh, they have not looked at transperineal biopsies, which is coming up. Uh, in conclusion, this uh, screening algorithm of population screening with PSA followed by MRI evaluation. Uh, to do targeted biopsies, not systematic biopsies, will reduce the clinically insignificant uh, uh, prostate cancer diagnosis while missing few numbers of significant cancers, but which is not statistically significant. With regards to the, in our setting, I believe that now we have already talked about the that population screening is not really applicable uh, 
with regards to prostate cancer because of the overdiagnosis and not having a significant uh, prognostic benefit. And uh, in our setting, we do have a difficulty in obtaining MRIs anyway. So the universal MRI screening might not be uh, possible for us. But uh, as a problem solving tool, uh, I think it's, it's useful. Uh, let's see in the matter of this. Thank you, Shiha, <clears throat> for the nice presentation. Uh, the expert panel, over to you, sir. Uh, any questions regarding the uh, discussion? Not, not really. Uh, I think he, he went through most of the important points. Uh, I, I don't have anything to add. So anyone has uh, any comment uh, regarding this? Uh, Last presentation regarding the MR evaluation in the PSA with the MRI in Sri Lankan setup and current uh, uh, understanding of uh, prostate CA screening. Yeah, I think, I think he, he did a uh, good presentation actually. As far as I can remember, when I come to the UK in uh, for foreign training, they actually yes, we did the MRI scan. At that time, one of my consultants told me that. Uh, MRI is not a real indication for uh, prostate cancer management. At that time, that was the thought. But now, it is mandatory. So even you request the uh, MRI scan, uh, there is a uh, line call, it's a free biopsy MRI scan. So it, it is a, now it is mandatory uh, to do a, a free biopsy MRI scan. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, you mentioned uh, uh, all the things related to the article. Then, uh, is there any questions uh, uh, or any comments? Uh, then we can wind up the program if it is really if there is no more questions. <clears throat> Yeah, then uh, thank you all of you, mainly the expert panel who has uh, Dr. Surendi sir, as well as uh, Dr. Suranga sir and Dr. Ravindran sir, as well as uh, the moderator panel, I and with uh, Dr. Taha, uh, and uh, the other colleagues who has presented the presentation as well as who has participated, all of them. Thank you all and good night. I think that I, I like to wind up the session. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Good night.